for how marvelously and miraculously you have given us your word and brought it down to us through the ages so that we have your truth for our lives. Help us to appreciate and praise you and help us to share your word, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right, we are on chapter 26, page 465, and uh, the restoration of the text. In other words, this has to do with textual criticism and actually what is put together, manuscript evidence, uh, and again, we're looking at 5,856 uh, manuscript uh, sources, and uh, we'll go through these briefly. Uh, let's go over to their biblical, the follow the italics on page 465, middle of the page where it says biblical manuscripts, then over, underline that, then to 466, down about a fourth, versions, uh, ancient versions of the scriptures. Then uh, in the middle of the page, quotations, quotations of the fathers. And then down toward the bottom, the last uh, uh, paragraph in italics, lectionaries. Uh, we discussed what all of those were. Now, because there's really one point to this this evening, because there are so many sources, this results in a lot of variance. Uh, do not label these, quote, mistakes but variance, one manuscript, one source, varying from another. And uh, the first full paragraph on 467 should be underlined. The multiplicity of manuscripts produces a corresponding number of variant readings. If you had only a handful of manuscripts, you'd have only a thimbleful of variants. But because you've got nearly 6,000 uh, ostraca, lectionaries, uncials, minuscules, uh, papyri, uh, you've got all these variants. Now, uh, let's go from there to f 468. New Testament variants. Number one, how many variants are there? The gross number, he goes into this. But what you want to do is go down to C under number one. You with me? To date, there are over, over 200,000 known variants. Now that may just seem like uh, overwhelming and devastating. But numeral two should be circled and the underlined, how are the variants counted? This begins to open up what this is all about. Uh, there is an ambiguity in saying that there are some 200 in variants in existing manuscripts of the New Testament because those only represent, remember, 200,000 variants, but you're underlining 10,000 places. Oh, this shrinks it down considerably. And then you're underlining the sentence. If one single word is misspelled in 3,000 different manuscripts, it counted as 3,000 variants. Now, obviously, a word misspelled does not impact the 
validity of the text or the meaning of the text. Uh, you read, even in typed material, but you read stuff all the time where maybe a letter you get from a relative, you're getting letters at Christmas. Uh, a word is misspelled and you notice it. It doesn't bother you. It doesn't change the meaning or the message at all. And yet here we're getting a lot of, quote, variance. Uh, down a couple lines below the 3,000 variant readings, one, two, three, remaining, the remaining significant variants are surprisingly few. Let's take uh, an example that uh, anybody who works in different translations would bump into. You have a Bible with you, no. Uh, Revelation, what is it? 1 5. He who has loosed us, is it 1 5 from our sins? Yes? Got it? All right. Do you remember the King James? Nobody. We're, I have abandoned the King James. The King James reads, he who has washed us from our sins. Really, whether it's loosed or washed, does that make any difference? Our sins are gone, that's the point. Whether we're loose, separated from them, or washed from them, they're gone. That's the point. How did, what's the, the difference? Well, the King James was following some manuscripts there's a word here, a Greek word, of, of three letters. And if you, those three letters are loosed, loosed. Now, if you add one more letter to that, you put in an O, an Omicron, you got washed. Uh, and that's, that's a variant. Uh, really, it doesn't make a lot of difference. There's no, no issue of doctrine in any of these. And there's no issue of meaning there either. Uh, and yet, one, one letter, and we'll see how that can be done. Number three on page 468, how did the variance occur? Now, uh, A under that, unintentional changes, just human uh, facility. Uh, Remember, you have no printing until the 15th century. So you got 1,500 years plus for the Old Testament, but for the New Testament alone. 1,500 years, the only way anybody had any scripture was somebody what? Hand copied it. Hand copied it. You could take a classroom of uh, 25 kids, write a paragraph on the board, and have each copy the paragraph and see how many variants you get. And some are just from uh, human, human people make mistakes, you know. And we, we went through the Old Testament, how fussy and fanatical the Jews were in copying the Old Testament, which reduced the number of variants tremendously. But it's not Jews copying the New Testament, remember. It's anybody and everybody. Because if you 
wanted, uh, Paul wrote a letter to the Galatians, and if you wanted a copy or you wanted a copy for your church, somebody had to copy that. And somebody else wanted a copy, somebody had to copy that. Then somebody copies his copy, and uh, so it goes. Now we're on page 469. You see under A, wrong division of words. This is resulted in the formation of new words. Remember, there was no punctuation in either the Old Testament or the New Testament manuscripts. And also, uh, often the, there was no spaces between words, and the authors give uh, a couple examples in English of what happens with this. You take that uh, he, you can take that sentence, he is nowhere, or it could read, he is now here. Or the old uh, one that's always cited next, did you ever see abundance on the table? Uh, and you can also read it, did you ever see a bun dance on the table? <laughs> and remembering that, for instance, in the in the uncials, uh, no no spaces, no punctuation, and uh, actually, uh, these kinds of errors could easily occur in copying. Then, two omission of letters. Uh, easily done. C, repetition. Uh, you're copying the same line or, or word twice. Then D, transposition of two letters. It, it becomes a nightmare almost, you see. So you got 1,500 years of no printing. Even after you had printing, you have errors. You ever see a typo in a book? Yes, yes. I, I catch them. And I don't know if they still do it, but the old famous printer of Bibles, you know, is the Oxford University Press. For years, uh, Oxford offered $5 back when $5 was worth something five dollars for any typographical error you found that had not been pointed out before, so they weren't paying twice on the same one, uh, protecting themselves. What were they doing? Spell checking. Right. Spell what? Check, yeah. <laughs> Early former spell check. Right. Well, they were admitting there the possibility oh, yeah, right. of it. Yeah. That's, yeah. The old printing, the old prints with the lead letters. Yeah, and then yeah. they're making everybody a proofreader. Yeah. And uh, when my book Revivals in the Bible was sent to the publisher, it was in a typescript. And it was clean. When they typeset it for the book, I ended up with a string of errors. That's just the way the world works. That's all. That were corrected after the first, first uh, print run. So we got around it. Then, uh, e, confusion over spelling or abbreviation, down in third or fourth line, heirs of the eye. The two, heirs of the ear. Uh, though the, there was not printing, in some monasteries they would have maybe ten monks 
making copies simultaneously. And someone was reading the text. And so someone is reading, and then you got 10 copies being made at the same time. Well, uh, guess what, uh, what takes place, you know, you get variance in there. And then uh, we're over on page 470. Go down one, two, three, four lines. In the Greek alphabet, there are two O's. We only have one in English. There's the next line, the omicron, which is uh, uh, like the O in Tom. But then you have the omega, which is a long O. I'm trying to think of a word. Help me. Oh, uh, no. Well, just the exclamation O. Oh. Uh, will do it. But in, in Greek, you had the two. And sometimes, the, so it was ended up in air and spelling. And then uh, airs of memory, they got in. Airs in judgment. Uh, over on page 471, airs of judgment. Dim lighting. None of these copies were made by electric lighting, remember, 1,500 years. Poor eyesight. And on it goes. Number five, errors in writing, rapid copying, intentional changes. Sometimes the writer just thought it ought to be another way and changed it, you know, and, and grammatical and linguistic. Uh, oh, we're over on 472. This would pertain, number two in parentheses, to the lectionaries where something is added in to make the service go smoother. And then uh, our harmonization, number three, to make one gospel conform to the other. It was well intended, but wrong. And, uh, oh, here, they got my example I gave you in number four, uh, factual changes. Third line, there's no doubt what happened in Revelation 1.5, a scribe change, loose untie, uh, from looseness from our sins to uh, L O. Notice that the U, the O, the Omicron is added in there, washed us, and so on. Uh, now, I want you to mark uh, at the very bottom, the footnote on page 472. There's a quote from Bruce Metzger, whom I have spoken to you of. Uh, number 26, see it? Shows why the Nestle on text reading is uh, preferred over the Textus Receptus because it has superior manuscript import uh, and, and follows. Now, here is uh, one of the most recent Greek New Testaments. And so these Greek scholars, textual scholars, it lists in the front Kurt Allen, Matthew Black, uh, Carlo Martini, Bruce Metzger, from this, and Alan Whitgren, Metzger was from Princeton, the others are from Europe, and Whitgren is from the University of Chicago. Now, uh, let's get an example here of what we're talking about. Here is a, a text, a Greek text, that makes use of all the manuscript evidence that there is. The uncials, uh, marked by, uh, uh, for instance, uh, Sinaiticus with a Hebrew letter al Aleph, and then B, Vaticanus, 
in Alexandria's and other uncials. Uh, the papyri numbered P, 45, 46, 47, and on. Uh, the lectionaries and so on. Now, here, you don't need to know Greek to catch on to what's going on. Here, what you have at the top in bolder type is the Greek text of this portion of Mark 7. Below the line is all the manuscripts that these scholars consulted to give you the text that is on, that is on the top. The top is the Greek text. Below the line, it's over half the page, actually. And you can see where it says P, that's papyri. Where it has capital letters, A-D, uh, there's Aleph, that's the, the uncials. Then you got the minuscules. And then it says a Byzantine lectionary, and it has the number for it. And it's all you can go back, you can go back and check. So pass it through and take, take a look. So this is what's called textual criticism using all the available manuscript evidence to arrive at the true text. And since there are 5,865, it is a job. Now, we're down to the bottom of 473. How significant are the variants? And this first statement is very important. It is easy to leave the wrong impression that we are speaking of 200,000 errors. No, no. Mentioned there are only 10,000 places where these 200,000 variants occur. The next question is, how significant are these 2,000 places? where they occur. We're at the top of page 474. Westcott and Hort, two British scholars. Uh, One-eighth only had any significance. They're merely mechanical matters of spelling or style, and only about one-sixteenth rise above trivialities. Now I want you to go down to the middle of the page and we're marking the small d, underline A.T. Robertson, who we discussed, who is the greatest Greek scholar who ever lived, suggested that the real concern of textual criticism, that is, using all the evidence to determine the true text, that the real concern of textual criticism is a thousandth part of the entire text. It's, we're almost to zero. That would make the reconstructed text of the New Testament, and you're underlining, 99.9% free from any real issue. And at no point is there any doctrinal matter concern. None of these things, for instance, like the one we were looking at in Revelation 1, 5, whether it's washed or whether it's loosed from our sins, these do not result in any denominational division or difference or in any doctrinal dispute at all. It's just not there. And so that, you, you should put a star on the margin there, the middle of the page. 99% free from it. And there is no other ancient document of which we have this high, high level of certainty. And that's number E. And it goes on to the Iliad, over on page 475, and so on. 
The last, uh, you see the big heading at the bottom of 475, the principles of textual criticism. Go up into the last sentence of the paragraph preceding that, and you should underline. The New Testament, then, has not only survived in more manuscripts than any other book from antiquity, but it has, you're underlining, <coughs> it has survived in purer form than any other great book. So the question is, uh, do we know that we really have the Bible after the passage of uh, 2,000 years? And the answer is just a, a strong affirmative. Yes, yes. Now, uh, questions, no questions? How are we doing here? We're on page 476. There are three kinds of external evidence. Uh, number one is chronological. We're looking at the date of the text type, not necessarily the manuscript. For instance, you could have a 12th century manuscript that is copied from a fourth century manuscript. So the fact that it's a 12th century manuscript is not that important. You could also have a 12th century manuscript that is copied from an 11th century manuscript, and that's not so good. So the, the date of the text type. Next, number two, geographical. The, the first one is the earlier the better, obviously. The earlier the better. That's why uh, Sinaiticus, fourth century, is so good, and the papyri dating back almost to the time of the Apostle John. Next, geographical. If you have two different manuscripts, and they're both from the same location, not so good. If you have two different manuscripts, and one is from uh, the Far East, and one is from the West, uh, from Italy, that's good. There's a difference. Then a genealogical, that the, wit the witnesses, they're weighed rather than merely counted. And that goes to families, number one, and individuals within. That gets highly technical. So that's the external evidence that we're talking about. Now, internal evidence. Let's hit the numbers. Number one, the more difficult reading, because a scribe would tend to simplify it. So preference is given to the more difficult reading. Two, the shorter reading, because scribes tended to sometimes put a little note in. You got all kinds of notes in your Bible, you know, uh, and so that's not new. Then the more verbally dissonant, number three, which means those are preferred because they're more difficult. And four, the less refined grammatical construction weighs in on it. Okay, we have sort of a summary on page 478, down toward the bottom. You see the numbers? This is important. Put a rocket in the margin by it. Older reading is preferred. We've been hammering on that. The more difficult, the shorter the one that best explains the variance, widest geographical support, conforms to the style and diction of the author to be preferred. Uh, each uh, Matthew has his way of going at it, so does John, and so on. And then seven, no doctrinal bias. 
in the Samaritan Pentateuch, they have Abraham taking Isaac upon Mount Gerizim, not Mount Moriah, to sacrifice him. Well, that's obviously they have uh, played with the text to make it conform to their, their religion uh, where they live. So it's obviously an error. And then we're over on the practice of, uh, of textual criticism. Second uh, line up from the very bottom, to the textus receptus, tradition belongs to the King James and the New King James. Uh, and then those based on the Nestle Allen text. That's the one that I just passed through here, which goes to all the manuscript evidence. Uh, now he's some Old Testament examples, New Testament examples. We're over on page 483. Uh, you got, you're down to the first full paragraph where it says 1 John 5, 7, and 8. People pick this up, of course, of thinking something has been left out of more recent translations because in the King James, it says there are three that bear witness. But really, the, these aren't in the text originally. And uh, it lists various translations, RSV, American Standard Version, Revised Standard Version, New English Bible, New American Bible. And now, right in the middle of that page is a sentence that says, the longer reading has virtually no, so you see, you have that sentence? The longer reading has virtually no support among the manuscript. Two lines down, its appearance is a few late, you're underlining late, Greek manuscripts. And it got caught up in the Texas Receptus and so appears in the King James. All right, uh, it mentions a couple others. Uh, uh, one that always uh, pops up, we're on page 484, last paragraph. John 7:53 down through John 8, 1 to 11. The woman caught in adultery. And uh, he goes into the detail on this. It, and number one, it car carries the weight. The, the, the passage in question, and uh, some omit it, some put it, translations put it in a footnote. Some have it in brackets with a note at the bottom, depending on what translation you have. But it does not appear in the oldest and most reliable. And number three, no Greek writer comments on this passage until the 12th century. Yeah. Why not? Well, it wasn't there. So uh, now let's go over to 489. This is a long and rather technical chapter. I've tried to help you get through it. We're to the summary and conclusion on 489. Textual criticism is the art and science of reconstructing the original text from the multiple manuscripts. Uh, now, we're down to the end that we have text, well, let's take the whole long sentence. Textual critics have made study judgments on many of these significant variants so that for all practical purposes, the modern critical editions of the Hebrew and Greek texts and what you had in your hand was a modern critical edition. Uh, represent with their footnotes, and notice 
what I showed you over half the page was footnotes. Exactly what the autographs contained, line for line, word for word, letter for letter. Now, uh, we're almost impossible for us to appreciate what the work that has been done. You have th these 5,865 sources, manuscript sources, and you're determining the true text. And it's multiple scholars. Denominational issues do not enter into it at all. A and uh, you, you have, uh, as a result, the actual text. Uh, so that the vast number of manuscripts assures us of getting the right text, but it also means somebody had to do a lot of work. So questions? No. Yes? Are we going to get into um, the Catholic Bible and how they omitted some things? How they omitted, like the, is it they omit, omitted one of the commandments? Oh, they didn't, oh. They, they numbered them differently. But they don't have special care. The, the, the Catholics and the Lutherans number the Ten Commandments differently but they're all there. If you look in any of the Catholic Bibles, it, it, it's the same. Now, in no Bible are they numbered. We number them. In catechisms, they are numbered. And among the Catholics and the Lutherans, they number them differently, but uh, they're all there. They're all there. Now, uh, any other question? Yes. Which ending of Mark do you think is the right one? What? Which ending of Mark mm -hmm. do you think is the right one? Because you skipped over the Mark passage. Oh, Mark. Yeah. Which one is uh, that one? There's I'm the going for the long ending. Okay. Okay. Let's, let's see. Let me check here. Uh, the long, they talk about the long, the long ending in, 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 in Mark. Good question. Mark 16. Uh, they're ending here with the ascension uh, and uh, so on, but I'm I'm going to go with the with the long one. Okay. Now, from here, it cheer up. It lightens up from here to the end. <laughs> oh my, we're into translations. No generation has had available so many translations of the Bible as we do. And though there are several in other languages, I'm talking about English. We have just an abundance of translations. So it's chapter 27 for two weeks from tonight, because next week is Christmas Day and there's no class, so two weeks from tonight is chapter 27, translations containing the Old Testament uh, text. And if you never knew what a Samaritan looked like, in that chapter there's a picture of one, a, a real Samaritan, they're still around. And uh, it's an, an interesting chapter. And then 
we get into the New Testament translations and, and whole Bible translations and there's almost no no end to them but uh, which you should go home and check how many different translations you have it would be a rare uh, home that does not have four or five maybe Bible translations so that's on the docket for two weeks from tonight. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word come to us. We thank you for those who have paid the price and study and have the skills to sift through all the evidence and come to the true text that we are assured that we have for which we thank you in Jesus' name, amen.